Hello everyone, my name is Ayn Kao. I'm the president of the Falun Dafa Club at Harvard Griffin Jesus. And uh, together with um, two other organizations, uh, we are able to host this uh, force organ harvesting uh, a threat to humanities, a mini symposium. And we also got the scope sponsor from Harvard University um, Asia Center. And when I engage in this with, in conversation with faculties and with my fellow students at Harvard, and when we mention force organ harvesting, there are three uh, typical answers that I usually get. First is, I don't believe you. What is the evidence? Second is, it's too dark. I don't want to know about it. And the third is, the worst is, what did you do to be treated this way? And it troubled my heart uh, greatly, but as an immunologist in training, I am trained to see the pattern. And I realized, this is exactly the same way the contemporary usually treat any atrocities in human histories. Refute its existence, uh, refuse to know, and diffuse the issues. And if we keep this pattern going, the evildoers will keep exploiting it, and like it has always been to, throughout human history. So that's also the reason why we host this series of events at Harvard today and tomorrow. And this is the first of the three, uh, which you can, and you can find more information in the program book that you have about movie screening, as well as the uh, panel discussion tomorrow at the Harvard Medical School. And in this series, we aim to prevent, present a fact-based evidence and method and facilitates the open discussion led by experts and provides a case study uh, on global human rights violation. To achieve this goal, we welcome questions. We welcome critics. We even welcome opposing ideas. But we hope uh, all of us will engage as a member of a large community, the Harvard community. And I also want to say thank you to Harvard College students for eager solidarities and Harvard Undergrad uh, Tibetan Cultural Association for co-hosting events and um, uh, generous uh, sponsorship from Harvard University Asia Center. And finally, let me introduce the moderator for the forum today, Mr. A Ping Chang. Uh, he's um, the former Edward Mason Fellow from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And Mr. Chang is a seasoned professional uh, with diverse uh, background in government, non-government and private sectors. He has been a panelist in institution, including European Parliament, uh, U.S. Congress, uh, United Nations of Human Rights, and uh, most importantly, uh, he's the Harvard alumni, and he's here uh, to moderate uh, the event. Uh, so welcome, Apin. Welcome back to Harvard. Thank you, I'm Paul. Uh, I know you're going to graduate very soon. We're going to miss you here. Uh, I feel like homecoming. 20 years ago, well, I shouldn't reveal my uh, age, maybe just a while ago, um, I organized two China forums here in this very room. And uh, we had a full audience actually on all China related topics. Back then, things are quite different. The street parking is free. And the uh, Vietnamese restaurant on Half Square, the big bowl of uh, beef soup. So it's only uh, $3.99. Now it's over $10. <laughs> so things are really different now. Um, but I, we are coming to uh, meet, meet here today for a very important topic, um, uh, the false organ harvesting. I started getting involved in 2006 together with David Matis. Actually, we, we had a congressional hearing uh, in the same year uh, in the Congress and then later at the European Parliament on this very same topic. So I want to introduce David as the first speaker, the keynote speaker today. Um, he's been working on the topic for years. He's a very well-known international human rights lawyer uh, from Winnipeg, Canada. Somewhere is a little bit warmer than here. Um, he authored The Bloody Harvest, Harvest with the, uh, David Kilgore, the former Canadian Secretary of State for East Asia. Um, and he also is a co-founder uh, with David Kilgore and Ethan Gottman, who is an independent journalist 
uh, the International Coalition to End all, uh, Transplant Abuse in China. And he is also a member of the Order of Canada and a member of the Canadian delegation to the United Nations. And he also testified before the uh, China Tribunal held in London, uh, which was chaired by uh, 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 Sir uh, Jeffrey Nice, who uh, actually uh, is King's counsel who prosecuted the former leader of the Yugoslavia at ICC, International Criminal Court. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, uh, introduce uh, David uh, Matus and welcome you to come to the panel. I once joked with him, how, he, how could he finish two uh, law degrees at Oxford in three years? He said there was no law against studying hard. <laughs> uh, so with that, <laughs> platform's yours. So you have 30 minutes. Well, uh, Irping, uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, it's good to see you again, and good to see you uh, all here. Uh, and uh, because uh, I've been involved in this uh, issue for quite some time now, since 2006, uh, which is uh, 18 years, uh, I could speak for more than 30 minutes. I could probably speak for two days, but uh, I, I am going to stick to my 30 minutes. and. Uh, if you, there's a, anything you think I should have said that I, I didn't say it because of shortness of time. Now, I'm a lawyer in Winnipeg in private practice. My clients have been primarily refugee claimants seeking protection in Canada. I've been engaged in this professional work for almost all of my professional career. I've also been heavily engaged in international human rights work through non-governmental organizations and as a member of Government of Canada delegations to international conferences. My focus in all this work has been mass atrocities. I've become familiar through my work with the human rights situation in many countries, including China. I try as best I can not only to assist my refugee clients in obtaining protection, but also through my NGO and Canadian governmental delegation work to combat the human rights violations which cause them to flee. In addition, to, uh, in addition to the tribunal and court work for individual clients, I have become involved in research, writing, advocacy, and activism addressing mass atrocities. A woman with the pseudonym Manny made a public statement in Washington, D.C. in March 2006 that her ex-husband had been harvesting corneas of Falun Gong practitioners in Sujiatin Hospital in Shenyang City and Linang Province in China from 2003 to 2005. Other doctors have been harvesting in that hospital other organs. The Falun Gong practitioners uh, were killed through the organ extraction and their bodies were cremated. The Chinese government immediately denied what Annie said. Shortly after, a Washington-based NGO, the Coalition to Investigate Persecution Against the Falun Gong, asked me and the late David Kilgore to investigate whether what Annie said was true. Now, it was and is common for me to be asked to assist in human rights work. This request, though, was unusual, though, because of the difficulties it posed. Because of my work on human rights and refugees, I knew at that time that Falun Gong was a set of exercises with the Spiritual Foundation started in 1992 with the teachings of Li Hongji. Uh, and uh, the uh, Falun Gong is a, a, a quasi equivalent of, uh, of, of yoga. I knew that the practice was initially encouraged by the Communist Party as beneficial to health but then repressed by the party decree uh, without being legally banned in 1999 after it got too popular for the party's liking. That repression, wrongful though it was, did not mean, of course, that Falun Gong practitioners were being killed for their organs. The coalition who asked uh, David Kilgore and me to do the research didn't give us any data, any money, or any instructions. From our part, I had no idea whether what Annie said was true or not. And what's more, her story presented a conundrum. How was it possible to know whether what Annie was saying was true or not? The question, question was not just how do we prove what Annie said was true, the question was also how do we disprove what Annie said if it was not true? 
What Annie was saying meant that there were no victims to interview because the victims were all killed. There were no bodies to autopsy because the bodies were all cremated. There was no crime scene to visit uh, since the crime crime scene and operating theater would have been cleaned up immediately afterwards. There were no accessible records, uh, since what records the, there are belong to Chinese hospitals and prisons, labor camps and detention centers, none of which are publicly available. The sole witnesses available were perpetrators who were unlikely publicly to confess to crimes that they had committed. The question whether what Annie said was true was difficult enough that it was unlikely, I concluded, to get much of a response either from human rights NGOs or intergovernmental organizations or the media. Human rights NGOs, they, though they have some research capacity, are for the most part campaign organizations. They look for the easily verifiable, not just because it makes research easier, but it also because it makes campaigning easier. Intergovernmental organizations have little internal research capacity and tend to rely on the work of NGOs. As for the media, they cater to readers, listeners, and viewers with short attention spans. If a story cannot be told quickly and simply, it normally cannot be told at all. Yet addressing a claim of human rights violations with little or no evidence is a situation to which I've become quite accustomed. That, in fact, has been my daily work as a refugee lawyer. Refugee claimants would come to my office with stories of horror, the, the clothes on their backs, and little else. They, of course, have this advantage they are witnesses to what happened to them, yet they are often faced with skeptical refugee tribunal members who suspect that the claimants are e economic migrants making up stories in order to move them from a poor country to a rich country. Are the stories these clients are telling true or not true? Answering that sort of question is not that different from assessing the truth of the story Annie told. Often when victims or the representatives come to me for general assistance to combat a human rights uh, situation abroad, I can send them off to the media or the local member of parliament or a human rights NGO or a UN human rights mechanism. I realize those that for what Annie said, that would not do. If something was going to be done, David Kilder and I were going to have to do it ourselves. But the question was, what was that something to be? I began instruct, uh, constructing imaginary evidentiary trails, trails that would either prove or disprove what Annie said. In doing so, I followed uh, four principles. One was never to rely on rumor or hearsay. If someone told me what someone else had told him or her, I would put the information to one side. Second, I refused to rely on information from perpetrators, and at least until the initial conclusion was made. In the course of our initial worker, work, some perpetrator whistleblowers did come forward to offer testimony subject to various conditions, usually anonymity and sometimes aid in immigration. But I turned all such offers aside because I have, in the most part, in the past, found in addressing other human rights violations that at least some perpetrator information was self-exonerating and unreliable. Third, I insisted that all information I saw anyone else could see. No one after work was done had to rely on our conclusions. Anyone who wanted to do so could look at the information we considered and come to his or her own conclusion. Fourth, I determined not to draw conclusions either way, yes or no, right or wrong, uh, true or false, uh, 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 either one way or the other based on one bit of evidence only. Rather, I intended to have regard to all the evidence before coming to any conclusion. Well, the conclusion was, uh, after all of that, that our research was that the fellow Gaon practitioners in, indeed were being killed for their organs not just in Suchiatin, but throughout China, not just in the period when Annie's husband was organ harvesting, uh, but uh, from, which was from 2003 to 2005, but from 2000 uh, to the date of our report. Now, the evidence is voluminous. Uh, David Kilgore and I produced three versions of report in our report in 2006, 2007, 2009 in book form under the title Bloody Harvest. Ethan Gutman, an American journalist who interviewed us and then wrote his own book on the subject uh, in 2014 titled The Slaughter came to the same conclusion David Kilgore and I did. Torsten Trey, who's with us here today, and I co-edited a book of essays on the subject titled State Organs. 
there are several academic articles on the subject from a variety of independent researchers all supporting our conclusions. In 2016, David Kilgore, Ethan Gutman, and I produced a joint update to our separate works. An independent people's tribunal, the China Tribunal in 2020, came to the same conclusion we did that the mass killing of Falun Gong for their organs was happening at, at that date beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, the 2016 update runs to almost uh, 700 pages with almost 3,000 footnotes, each providing a citation to a verifiable su uh, supported source. The China Tribunal judgment with its appendices runs to almost 600 pages. Uh, again, uh, the list of uh, relevant academic articles uh, is long. The problem that this accumulation presents is not too little evidence of the mass killing of Falun Gong for their organs, but rather too much evidence. It takes a lot of time to go through all this evidence, and many, I would say most people, don't have the time and patience to do so. Yet, if they do do so, they cannot, if they do not do so, they cannot claim that this abuse has not been proven. The Chinese Communist Party and its friends have denied that this abuse is happening, mostly through insults directed at myself and other researchers. Yet the uh, evidence itself is irrefutable. And, and given the, the volume of evidence uh, there is, as I've indicated, as, uh, as, uh, as I began, it would take days, if not weeks, for me to go through it all. But I, I'm going to try to at least summarize some of the uh, evidentiary trails with support of this, this conclusion. I mean, my, my talk is titled Facts and Laws, so I, I am going to try to grapple a, a bit uh, with the facts. First of all, uh, investigators made calls to hospitals throughout China, claiming to be relatives of patients needing transplants, asking if the hospitals had organs of fellow gone practitioners for sale on the basis that since Falun Gong through their exercises are healthy, the organs would be healthy. We obtained on tape, transcribed and translated uh, admissions uh, throughout China saying, yes, we have them quite down. And, and these interviews are posted on the internet. And if you know Mandarin, you can hear them yourselves. Number two, uh, Falun Gong practitioners and non-Falun Gong practitioners alike who were detained and who then got out of detention out of China told us that uh, that Falun Gong practitioners were systematically blood tested and organ examined while in detention. Other detainees were not. The blood testing and organ examination could not have been for the health of the practitioners since they had been tortured, but it, it would be necessary for organ transplants because for transplants you need blood type compatibility and ideally tissue type compatibility. You need healthy organs and ideally organs the same size as the patient. The uh, uh, second thing we, we were told uh, by this group was that Falun Gong practitioners came from all over the country to Tiananmen Square in Beijing to appeal or protest were systematically arrest, arrested. Those who revealed their identities to their captors would be shipped back home to their uh, localities uh, and their immediate environment would be implicated in their Falun Gong activities and penalized. To avoid harm to people in their locality, many detained Falun Gong practitioners declined to identify themselves. The result was a large Falun Gong practitioner population in detention whose identities the authorities did not know, and the people who knew them did not know where they were. Uh, this became a remarkably undefended group of people, even by Chinese standards. And, and this, this group was almost entirely not released, it just disappeared. The third thing we heard from, uh, 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 we could see about uh, uh, this group and what we heard from people leaving China was that the party was engaged in a prolonged, persistent, vitriolic national and international campaign of incitement to hatred against Falun Gong. The campaign has been effective in promoting their marginalization, depersonalization, and dehumanization in the eyes of many people, uh, uh, certainly in China uh, and, and elsewhere. To their jailers, Falun Gong were not human beings entitled to respect for human rights and dignity. Now, we also interviewed patients who went to China for transplants, and, and they told us that Waiting times for transplants for organs in China were days and weeks, and everywhere else in the world, uh, waiting times are months and years. 
Appointments could be made for transplants of vital organs, liver, lung, and transplant at fixed times, uh, weeks and four months in, uh, uh, in advance. Uh, the, these facts meant, meant I mean, you, you can't make it a fixed appointment for a heart transplant without somebody being booked to be killed for their organs. Uh, and so uh, that, that was uh, one thing we were told by patients. Another thing patients uh, would tell us is, and we could see also from websites, there's a heavy, heavy militarization of transplantation in China. Hospitals with a ready supply of available organs are often military hospitals. And, and military hospitals in China are accessible to the public, to, to foreigners, uh, not like military hospitals everywhere else in the world. They're, they're money-raising businesses to help uh, the army get money for arms. Uh, even in civilian hospitals, the doctors performing operations are often military personnel. Uh, the military have a common culture with prison guards and readier access to prisoners as organ sources uh, than civilian hospitals and civilian personnel do. Military hospital websites used to boast uh, that uh, the, uh, the sale of organs was a prime source of funds. Uh, a lot of stuff that we cited has since been taken down. We've uh, archived it, but it's not uh, physical in, uh, within China. Uh, the, another thing that patients would tell us is there is an inordinate secrecy, uh, inordinate secrecy surrounding transplantation in China. The names of doctors are not identified. Patients are not allowed to bring their own doctors with them. Before our 2006 report came out, Chinese doctors used to provide letters to patients indicating the treatment given and counseled afterwards. But the letters ceased after the publication of our report. A fourth component of evidence I draw to your attention uh, is uh, there's no other explanation for the transplant numbers than sourcing from prisoners of conscience. China is the largest transplant country by volume in the world. Yet until 2010, China did not have a deceased donation system, and even today that system produces donations which are relatively small. Until 2013, China did not have an organ distribution system. So living donor sources are limited in law to relatives of donors and officially discouraged because live donors suffer health complications from giving up an organ. The government of China until 2005 took the position that all organs came from donations, even at the time, though at the time they did not have a donation system. They then acknowledged that the overwhelming proportion of organs for transplants in China came from prisoners, but asserted that the prisoners were all sentenced to death and donated their organs to atone for their crimes. The number of prisoners sentenced to death and then ex executed that would be necessary to supply the volume of transplants in China is far greater than even the most exaggerated death penalty statistics and estimates. Moreover, in recent years, death penalty volumes have gone down, but transplant volumes, except for a short blip in 2007, remain constant. The government of China has refused to provide death penalty statistics on the basis that they are state secrets. Since 2015, the government of China has gone back to its original narrative that all organs are coming from donations. Yet any, and, and there have been several independent verification of donation numbers from donation centers, continues to produce tiny numbers. The government of China claims that donations registered at donation centers are augmented by donations from family members of accident victims, brain dead but cardiac alive. Yet in China, patients uh, tell us transplants are booked in advance, but accidents cannot be booked in advance. And of course, many accidental people uh, have their organs. If they're brain uh, dead and uh, cardiac alive, the, the, the accidents will damage their organs very often as well. Uh, number five, uh, the update David Kilgore, Ethan Gutman, and I did in 2016 uh, was conceptually a simple exercise focusing only on transplant totals by adding up transplant volumes from individual hospitals. We produced a figure of transplant volumes 10 times what Beijing said was Chinese plants, uh, uh, transplant volumes. Our figures went from 60,000 organs transplanted in the early 2000s to 100,000 uh, by 2016. 
if we extrapolate the organ prices posted and and there were posting of prices before a report in 2006 which have been taken down since uh it's that, uh, uh, and if we apply them to current volumes we arrive at a figure of 8.9 billion dollars being made in china from the sale of organs every year number six uh jay levy uh, matthew robertson and raymond hinda uh published a study in january 2019 which showed that the chinese official transplant yearly volume figures conformed almost precisely to a math mathematical formula uh, these are the official government figures the analysis suggested data manufacture and manipulation in number seven, Jay Levy and Matthew Robertson published a study in October 2021, which examined Chinese language transplant publications and concluded that 71 of these publications provided evidence that the removal of, uh, of, of organs during organ procurement must have been the uh, proximate cause of the donor's death. The conclusion was that the physicians in, the, in China have participated participated nationwide in executions by organ removal. Number eight, practitioners of or Falun Gong are not the only prisoners of the conscience victims uh, of forced organ harvesting uh, that, that, that we uh, interviewed. Uh, Tibetans, House Christians, and Uyghurs have also been victims, telling us much the same story about these groups that we've heard from. Uh, other uh, from the patients and from people, uh, prisoners, and so on. The primary, but not the only Christian victims, have been Eastern Lightning or the Church of Almighty God. Uh, number nine, uh, Ethan Gutman, currently a senior research fellow for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, at a hearing in the 10 uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission in May 2022, stated that witnesses from approximately uh, 20 camps in Xinjiang, uh, China, uh, told him uh, from 2017 uh, that between 2.5% and 5% disappeared annually in the 28-year-old age group, which is uh, when the organs are uh, at their healthiest. With approximately 1 million Uyghurs and other minorities in these various camps in Xinjiang, uh, Gutman estimated that 25,000 to 50,000 camp detainees were being organ harvested every year. Uh, this uh, Xinjiang organ harvesting is particularly visible since there are visibly dedicated lanes in Xinjiang airports for the transport of organs. Uh, number 10, also particularly visible, has been the explosion in transplant inf infrastructure in China shortly after the repression of Falun Gong began. Coincident uh, with that repression was a boom in the building of transplant hospitals, transplant wings of general hospitals, a huge increase in transplant beds and transplant staff. The system is designed, is reliant upon uh, the uh, an inexhaustible supply of organs. So I'm going to start my reference to, to facts here, uh, though I could go uh, on, of course. And if, and if anyone is inclined to want, want more, almost all of the evidence to which I've referred is posted on the internet and accessible without cost. And, and then, of course, a lot else. So let me say a few words. Uh, uh, about the law. There's a 1984 Chinese law which explicitly allows for the sourcing of organs from prisoners without their consent or the consent of their families, provided their bodies are unclaimed. That law remains unrepealed. Chinese hospitals uh, were advertising globally for transplant tourism, posting high prices for organs in many languages, uh, advertising organs available on demand. The 2000 law set hospital medical fees for transplants far below the publicly advertised amounts. Research uh, by contact with patients sh uh, showed that the exorbitant fees continued to be charged. The 2000 law also required a consent from the sources for the sourcing of uh, organs, but without any penalties. Uh, and the new law did not repeal the 1984 law. Uh, which said consent was not necessary. Uh, a 2000 law uh, set out specific uh, penalties for the 2007 prohibitions, but without again uh, repealing the 1984 law. A more recent law uh, uh, adopted in October 23 to come into force in May 
2024 addresses procedures for obtaining cadaveric and living organs. However, there's nothing requiring openness about the functional operation of the procedures or the results. The concepts of the transparency, traceability, and openness to scrutiny are not mentioned in the new law. Yet these are all essential components of the World Health Organization guiding principles on human cell tissue and organ transplantation. There's no prohibition in the 2023 regulation against sourcing organs from prisoners. China is not subject to the rule of law. The Communist Party runs the legal system and does not enforce the law against itself. Anything institutionalized by the party, as is the mass killing of prisoners in conscience for their organs, is above the law. Now, outside of China, there's a Council of Europe Convention Against Trafficking in Human Organs, which obligates states' parties to prohibit complicity by nationals or permanent residents in transplant abuse abroad. There are 15 states which have ratified the convention. The most recent was France in 2023. Uh, the Convention is not limited to Council of Europe states. Any state in the world can sign on to it, provided the Council of Europe agrees. There are also six jurisdictions which have not ratified the Convention and which have nonetheless legislated in, in, in compliance with uh, legislation against extraterritorial complicity in organ transplant abuse. Uh, those are Israel, Taiwan, Italy, South Korea, the United Kingdom, and Canada. The United States has before Congress a bill requiring uh, revocation of passports, reporting and sanctions if there's complicity in forced or, or organ harvesting. It's called the Stop the Forced Organ Harvesting Act. The bill has passed the House of Representatives with only two votes against and is now before the Senate. Simply legislating against uh, complicity uh, 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 with uh, forced organ harvesting abroad does not get us very far. The 21 jurisdictions which have le legislated against transplant tourism are a small number compared to the 193 member states of the United Nations. Yet legislation alone isn't going to stop transplant tourism into China uh, or other countries. The legislation has to be enforced. How is that going to happen? Well, in, in what remains uh, in uh, the uh, text that I have uh, is, is going through and trying to answer that question uh, very briefly in the time uh, I have left. I'll just mention some of the solutions uh, that try to address that problem. And, and the problem, of course, is that uh, when somebody goes abroad for a, a transplant uh, into China, they don't tell anybody except perhaps their doctor where they're going or why they're going, uh, or, or maybe their family members. Uh, and they don't tell anybody when they come back. And as a result, uh, again, except maybe their doctor or their family members. So how, how is such a law going to be enforced? The, uh, what Israel's done is set up an inspection system so that uh, the, uh, uh, what has to happen uh, is that the transplant records have to be made ex accessible to the uh, uh, inspection system and the inspection system isn't going to necessarily see that somebody's going to uh, go to China, but they will see that somebody's on a transplant list and then goes off the transplant list, and and then that can lead them to further inquiries. There is legislation before the Australian Parliament now uh, uh, <laughs> requiring the issue to be part of a customs declaration, asking people who come from uh, designated list of countries uh, to be asked. Uh, uh, specifically, uh, did you get a transplant in, in that country? I mean, people may not answer honestly, but uh, it, uh, if they do, that gives some information. If they don't, it gives a, a, a recourse later. There's been a lot of back and forth about uh, compulsory reporting by doctors. Uh, the, there's a, a lot of compulsory reporting by doctors of various criminal activities in, in Canada. It's quite common to require doctors by law to report gunshot wounds, uh, to, reply, to report child sexual abuse, and, and, uh, to report pilot blindness. I mean, there's a whole list of them. Uh, and and uh, this could be added to the list, but on the whole, the medical profession has been opposed to it on the basis that it's a breach in uh, patient confidentiality. And so it's a live issue, but uh, it, it's something that's uh, uh, being considered. The, uh, let me just say, by, by way of conclusion, uh, that 
this this conference is uh, titled Forced Organ Harvesting, a, a Threat to Humanity. Now, it isn't just a, a threat to Falun Gong. The, uh, I mean, we've seen it uh, spread to the Uyghurs, and, and it spread to the Uyghurs long. I mean, there was a, a few cases with Uyghurs uh, in, in the early 2000s, but it became a vast problem for the Uyghurs in 2017, long after it, it, it was a... Uh, a problem with Van Gogh in China. If that abuse had stopped in 2006, uh, when uh, David Kilgore and I produced our report, uh, the Uyghurs wouldn't be victimized today. But they are. China has been trying to promote uh, promote a, a, a kind of uh, system throughout Europe, uh, throughout uh, Asia, through South Korea, Japan, for the trans uh, a transplant system that is regional wide, uh, like exists in Europe which, of course, would increase the victimization. So uh, what we're dealing with is indeed a, a threat, not, not just to Falun Gong, but a threat to hu humanity. And let's try to stop it before it spreads even further than it has. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um... By the way, he was nominated in 2010 for Nobel Peace Prize for his uh, humanitarian uh, effort. Next speaker will be uh, Dr. Thorsten Che. He received his medical training in Germany before coming to the United States. And he has authored and um, specialized studies in false organ harvesting, and he's a founder of the Washington-based uh, nonprofit organization, Doctors Against False Organ Harvesting, which was nominated for Nobel Peace Prize in 2016, 2017, and 2024, and they received the, in the 2019 Mother Teresa, Teresa uh, Memorial Award for Social Justice. So you have 15 minutes. Well, thank you to the organizers of this very important meeting and uh, gathering that we have. It's a, it's a, it's a topic that should um, move all of us. Let me um, start by beginning you um, by uh, beginning to share a little bit how I got involved in, in this uh, topic. So in, um, in uh, March 2006, I read in the news that the wife of a surgeon uh, said what her husband confessed to her, and he said to her that he removed corneas from 2,000 Falun Gong practitioners. Um, shortly afterwards, uh, military doctor, veteran military doctor, sent a letter to the newspaper and said, "This is not only this is not a single case. He knows of 36 concentration camps. Uh, one has 14,000 14, Falun Gong practitioners detained, and he he saw himself that the uh, consent forms were uh, basically faked. So I cannot verify what this veteran military doctor said." but it broadened, for me, the scope of this issue. I, I learned that I have to think in a, in a broader way. Then, of course, um, okay. Okay. Uh, David and I, we, we shared almost 17 years to work on this uh, in, in uh, July. Um, 2006, uh, the report from David Kolger and David Meadows caught my uh, interest. Uh, they did phone calls, as mentioned, and in 14 of these phone calls, the, the doctors uh, in the Chinese hospitals admitted that organs were coming from Falun Gong practitioners. Here's an excerpt of one of these uh, phone calls where they say, is it from, yeah, it, the organs are coming from Falun Gong practitioners. They, the doctors have to go themselves to the prison to select them. They do a blood testing. And uh, of course, the Falun Gong practitioner itself does not know um, that, they are, that they are subject 
to force organ harvesting. And then I got so curious that I decided in July 2006 to go to the World Transplant Congress here in Boston. Um, I wanted to talk, try to talk to Chinese surgeons. Uh, I met one. He was a, um, a doctor who did who worked in the university lab in Germany. And he was asked uh, by two Chinese hospitals to come back to China to open a transplant ward. And I was uh, wondering uh, how come that there is such a need for transplants? Um, where do the, all those organs come uh, coming from? And he said um, the organs are coming from Falun Gong practitioners. Another doctor, I asked what he was doing. He, he worked in the uh, Tianjin uh, Hospital, Tianjin Hospital, and um, he he, I, he was in, in a liver transplantation. I asked how many liver transplants they do per year. He answered uh, in 2005 they did 2,000 liver transplants. So to put this into perspective, in all Germany, they perform 800 liver transplantations per year. In Argentina, all Argentina, 200 liver transplantations. So this single hospital performed 10, 10, 10 times more liver transplants in, in all Argentina. So this was me then in 2006, actually here in, in Boston, not far away, just a few miles from here at an impromptu um, press conference where I was asked to share my opinion. At that moment, I thought, what can I do? I'm just a single doctor, so I need to do more. At that, uh, at that press conference, I had the idea, I have to start an NGO, which then later become, became uh, Doctors Against Force Organ Harvesting. So uh, what, what, what had just happened? We heard about organ harvesting from living people. There was no term at that time. It was not organ trafficking, it was killing for organs. So we had to come up with a new term. And it was us, our, our NGO, that actually came up with this term to say uh, forced organ harvesting, to describe this as forced organ harvesting. Um, what is it? It's an organ procurement from living people where the donors are killed or uh, either shortly before or during the process of the organ harvesting. Of course, there is no voluntary consent. So the next question that we face is, uh, how, can we how can we provide evidence uh, for this issue. And of course, yeah, there's, uh, there are different understandings about what evidence is. So let's first take a moment to understand what evidence is. So a very simple, brief definition says that any information that can make a fact more or less probable counts as evidence. This evidence does not mean 100% proof. Evidence means it changes the probability for an event. And uh, there are some examples what can count as evidence. The first one is most important to us here, testimonies. So there's a historic um, example. And that example shows us how we handle actually evidence. So in, in 1942, Jan Karski, a Polish diplomat, saw um, that Jewish prisoners were uh, deported uh, from the Warsaw Ghetto. And he, he went in 1943, he um, went to see the Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter and told him about the Holocaust and what, happened, what he witnessed. And the justice said, I cannot believe you. He did not say that he's lying, but he cannot be believe him. So what is interesting is this is that there is an evidence of a testimony, but um, the evidence was dismissed based on disbelief. But a belief is not part of collecting, dismissing uh, evidence. So it, it's a, this, this um, example shows us that um, sometimes we do not handle evidence in the proper way. So we need to be careful. So another aspect is that we are used to live in an open society and that we can collect evidence as we wish. But we need to consider that China is not an open society. It's a closed society. It's a closed access. If you go to a hospital here in the US and say, 
you want to learn about the transplantation medicine in that hospital, they, they say, okay, you can take a look at the data. If you go to, if you arrive at a Chinese airport and say you're here to investigate forced organ harvesting, you probably won't even be able to, to leave the, the airport. So transplant numbers, that uh, was one of the uh, first aspects that we wanted to um, to share, to, to look at. And um, so we, we first wanted to understand the global volume of uh, transplants. Um, so over five years in, in worldwide, the transplant numbers increased by about 20%. When we looked at China, then during a time window of five years, the transplant numbers increased by 300% without a public organ donation program. That was kind of a surprise. And on the, uh, in, the, in the corner, you see uh, numbers for the liver transplantations, which increase exponential. So over 15 years, we see this curve of officially reported uh, transplant numbers. In our, in our group, we, we take the organs, the official numbers, uh, for the organ transplantations as a, as a reference. We don't uh, acknowledge those numbers, but we work with the official numbers. So the official numbers gave us uh, this curve, which has three surprising um, phases. First, the sudden increase, then the sudden decrease, and then the plateau. Yeah, and the, the decrease came shortly, uh, or is is correlated to the uh, to the year 2006 when the breaking news about the organ harvesting from Falun Gong practitioners broke. Why 2006? In the in 2006, the the, the well, in 2004 it peaked, but um, in 2005 there was a be before the 2000 before the breaking news the number already declined because the numbers are basically reported after year, the year. So in 2006, you uh, report the numbers for 2005. So the, it already reacted immediately to the breaking news. So what is astonishing here is that uh, it seems that the numbers decreased to diffuse the attention that came with the breaking news. The official explanation for uh, the organs were executed prisoners, as David mentioned. But the Duihua Foundation uh, um, showed that the number of executions decreased drastically. And if you compare it on the left side, the orange graph is, uh, are the executions. Then you see two things. In the beginning, from 2000 to 2003, there were many more executions than transplants. And uh, after 2004, there were more transplanted executions. It, is, it, it appears that these two curves are not correlated. And it, um, it's implausible why the uh, transplants increase when the executions decrease. Then um, with, with, if executed prisoners are not the source of the organs. Where do the organs come from? So we look at the organ donation numbers, the organ availability, and uh, wait times. So in 2005, Dr. Lavie had a patient uh, who, who told him that he has a heart transplantation scheduled in China with two weeks notice, which is unheard of if, if, if you are in the transplant field. In 2007, Dr. Imam, from Swiss, he was also invited to watch or participate in a heart transplantation operation. And he was asked, when do you want to operate, in the morning or afternoon? Which is also not typical for, for transplantations to choose the time. So uh, further, we, we then looked into the, the organ donation uh, registry. And um, there's a website that would show the numbers for transplants and organ donors, the numbers. 
And uh, we monitored that website over 18 months and we listed all the numbers and there were two numbers that stood out. So on December 31st, the number of the registered organ donors has actually increased by exactly 25,000. So first of all, it's a tremendous increase, but what, what is even more suspicious that on the last day of the calendar year, the, the number ended on three zeros, as you can see here at the end, the three last digits are the same. Uh, this is how it looks on as a graph. And sure enough, the following year in 2016, we saw the same, a sudden increase, this time by 88,000 uh, donors. So over um, three and a half years, this is the graph that we found. And you can see that in the beginning, there were some hiccups with the curve, but then they got the number on the a, on a right track. Um, of course, this was um, caused some suspicion, and it was then part of a of a, a peer-reviewed paper that they already mentioned. Um, a forensic statistical analysis found that these numbers were too good to be true; they were manufactured. Why? Because they are something too high. Um, we, we had. We chose to take another look from a different angle. We compared the donor numbers from three countries, the UK, the US, and China. Um, they have several millions of registered organ donors. China has only 375,000 in 2017. And then we compared it with uh, actual donors of that year. And then we found at the bottom, you see it here, the yield ratio that in the UK you need 15,000 registered organ donors to have one actual donor. In the US, you need about 13,000 registered donors to have an actual donor. <coughs> but in China, it seems uh, you only need 72 registered organ donors to find an actual donor. That is surprising. If you apply actually the, it seems like for the US and UK, um, the standard is one out of 15,000. If, if you apply this ratio on the actual uh, number of registered organ donors, you would expect that China in 2017 would have only 25 actual donors. So you, you can see, no matter how we treat these numbers, they don't they are implausible. Something is not right. In 2017, in the same year, um, from the statistic just now, a Korean film team went to the Tianjin hospital with a hidden camera, pretending that they have a relative who needs an organ. And they, uh, <laughs> they said, well, we need a kidney. The nurse said, it takes about two weeks to get a kidney, but if you pay $10,000 extra, you can get it in two days. So remember in that year, they only had 375 uh, registered organ donors. This is, uh, not, this is not plausible. Um, this will be covered a little bit later. The transplant infrastructure is another category of evidence that we looked into. Um, from between 1999 and 2006, the number of uh, transplant ho hospitals quadrupled, which is a surprise because there was no public organ donation program. Secondly, if you invest into the transplant infrastructure, mm -hmm. this is a, has a, a long-term process. That means there must be a confidence that there's ample supply of organs. But uh, remember, the official source the, ex the executed prisoners, they actually, de the number de decreased. So where does this confidence come from? So overall, we saw a boom, booming in the transplant infrastructure, the beds increase, 
uh, the value on uh, transplant units to, uh, uh, increase, uh, the revenue increase, the occupancy rate was high, the staff increase, nurses worked long hours, so everything was booming. However, as we saw earlier, the transplant, this is not reflected in the transplantation numbers. Yeah, you see here is a 10 year plateau where it seems, it seems the annual transplant numbers did not move. So how can you, how can you invest and show that the infrastructure is booming, but it doesn't, it's not reflected in the transplant numbers. Something is not right and something is being covered up. So we found that the transplant numbers are not plausible. Then the question is, where actually do the organs come from? And here's where the testimonies of witnesses come in. Um, there, were, there are thousands of testimonies um, from Falun Gong practitioners where they said, um, for example, in one case, one practitioner was blood tested 10 times while uh, detained for two years. The practitioner did not get any health care, was not ill. Then why, you know, a, a blood test is not free, it costs. Why would they invest this money for repeated blood tests? In another case, um, 200 Falun Gong practitioners from a detention camp were bused on one day to a hospital to, to undergo blood tests. Yeah, again, who pays for these blood tests? Then um, in another case, a uh, practitioner was just uh, arrested and then taken to the hospital. The policeman asked him, um, uh, to, wanted, they wanted to take blood. The practitioner said, I don't want because it, they, uh, I know what you're doing with it. You want to take my organs. And the policeman said, yes, this is exactly what we want to do. That's what he told to the practitioner. In another case, a practitioner was pushed in the, in the gown to the operation room, but due to international attention and calls to the hospitals and to, um, um, I guess, to the city, because of the international attention, this um, procedure was aborted. He, he was pushed in the, into the operation room, but then brought back to the ward and released. This is an example. Uh, there are only very, very few pictures that um, can be provided. Um, so this is uh, one uh, Falun Gong practitioner. Her name is Gao Rong, and uh, the next photos are not nice. So she was tortured with an electric baton, and later she also died from the torture. Th this is not a forced organ harvesting case, but you can imagine if somebody is willing to torture to this extent, then the step from the torture to the forced organ harvesting is very small. These are photos from two practitioners. As you can see, they have long stitches, which does not make sense. It, it does not, doesn't make sense to uh, perform an autopsy on prisoners who undergo forced labor, etc. So there was, there must have been another purpose to for these stitches. So probably two cases of forced organ harvesting. So this is a summary of the evidence that I just uh, presented, but um, I want to cover two two other aspects here. Uh, implications. <laughs> So to under, understand the implications, we first need to understand that, that uh, according to the president of the uh, Chinese Supreme Court, the Chinese Communist Party is formally above the constitution. If it's above the constitution, it's ab above the law, and of course, above ethical standards. So if the um, Communist Party says that forced organ harvesting is legal in China, then it is legal in China. So we cannot assume that our ethical standards that we appreciate here in the West are applicable in China. So where are the implications? Can we train medical doctors from China in transplantation here in, in the West? What is, how do we react if China offers organ exchange platforms as they did uh, in, in uh, 
Taiwan a few years ago, if they do it with the Belt and Road Initiative. This is in process in, in Europe. And how do we react to research papers on the, in the transport field if, if we know that the, those are not based on ethical procedures? How to respond? Again, first, we need to understand since 1999, there's a persecution on Falun Gong, and uh, this was captured in a peer-reviewed paper as described as cool genocide. There are incentives for forced organ harvesting. The forced organ harvesting delegates the execution from the ex execution sites to the operating room. So the, the doctors have financial incentives, but the government has different interests. They use this as an umbrella to destroy and eradicate Falun Gong. They try to do it. At the end, it's, it's about to, to silence this group. So if we, if we understand that the, the purpose of forced organ harvesting is to silence uh, th this group, then actually you can ha have already an approach how to defeat it. You can defeat it by breaking the silence, by speaking about it, by sharing about it. This is something that every person can do aside from laws and other procedures. Um, just to round it up, this is a QR code for a report that we published on this topic. Thank you. All right, thank you. We have uh, Dr. Welton Gilchrist. He is the Associate Professor in Oncology Division at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He completed residence at Scripps Mercy Hospital in San Diego and uh, the fellowship at the University of Utah, and he's a cancer specialist, program director for hematology and oncology fellowship program at the University of Utah School of Medicine. He also serves as the deputy director of Doctors Against Foster Organ Harvesting. You have 15 minutes. 15, okay. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Right. thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Oncal, and the uh, organizations that, that brought us here today. It's really a pleasure. It's an honor to be part of um, this group of, of speakers, and uh, I really am honored to be here. My day-to-day -day life is uh, I'm a clinician. I see a lot of patients. I actually am an expert in liver cancer, so I see patients uh, that, that are afflicted with hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. And one of the things that I, that, that one of my passions is being able to offer patients transplant, liver transplants, to uh, effectively cure them or help them with, with their cancer. So that's one of my passions. And then, as Erping mentioned, one of my other passions is really teaching. And so I think the idea of a place like China where transplant essentially or effectively did not exist um, really until the 2000s. Uh, and, and a lot of that's cultural. There's a, there's a Confucius idea that the body is to stay intact into the next life. So transplant is not in the fabric of a lot of Southeast Asian cultures. So the, 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 the idea that how did, it, how did a nation like China go from a standstill in transplant to doing thousands of transplant, where did they learn how to do that? Well, one of the first transplants that was successful in the world happened right here in Boston in 1954, a kidney transplant between two twin uh, young men. So I, I want to go through the recent literature, but really with an eye on, I think, three really important components about the Chinese Communist Party. One is... As, as Torsten mentioned, it's really a closed off society. It's hard to get in. So how do you get data out of, of China? And this is what David Betis uh, was tasked to do with David Kilgore back in 2006. So how do you do that? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a couple of papers, uh, one that was published by the Chinese and, and one that actually has been mentioned here and go into it a little bit more because I think it, it exists in our literature it's in the last few years. I think that's one important thing. The second thing is, once something gets published, it disappears, like David Matus mentioned. For example, in 2005, you could go onto Chinese 
transplant hospital websites and find this is the cost for a liver transplant. Come to China, it's $120,000 and you'll wait two weeks. And it also told you where all the surgeons were trained. They're, they were trained in the United States, the University of Nebraska, here in Boston, et cetera. So this, this was all there once it's published and says, well, look, this is evidence that you have an unlimited supply of organs, it disappears. So I think that's a second piece. And then the third piece that I think is really one of the biggest challenges for me, I'm sure David Matus would say the same thing and Torsten Trey, this is a new unimaginable crime. Taking the operating room, taking surgeons and doctors and using them as the weapon uh, against your, your, your prisoners of conscience is something that none of us could think of. So how do we deal with it? And do the laws that exist help? Or do we need new, more specific laws, new, more specific um, uh, ethical principles that, that specifically target and talk about forced organ harvesting? So I'm the deputy director of Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting. I'll talk about the two papers. One was published uh, in April of 2022. And I am part of this multidisciplinary liver clinic and one of the, the, the people that I founded this clinic with is the head of abdominal transplant at the University of Utah. And I remember when this was published and I remember turning to her in clinic and I said, have you seen this? And she said, yeah, my family keeps talking to me about this paper, execution by organ procurement, breaching the, the dead donor rule. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, she, she didn't want to talk about it. She didn't want to think about it and she didn't really want to address it. And then th this came out, because I think one of the questions for me that came up was, well, once COVID hit, will it stop with, with, with an embargo or a lot less um, uh, travel back and forth in and out of China, will it stop? And, and this was a shocking publication that we responded to uh, as an organization. And then I, I do want to mention two, statement, um, two statements and position statements from uh, international societies for, uh, for transplant and for the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, which specifically address forced organ harvesting. So I think we've gotten to a place where it's very well established that it's happening. One thing that I wanted to point out is I believe that it, it continues to happen and probably doesn't just continue at the plateau that Torsten Trey was showing us, but I think has been amped up over the years. Whoa, that was fast. Let's see. How do I get back here? Um, okay, so one of the first things, th this, this is a timeline. I'm not sure. Okay. This is a timeline, and, and I do want to point out that the, with the 2006, when that report came out, th this is when a lot of things became, I think, hidden more in the shadows in transplant in China. But China, beginning in 1984, had a law in the books that, that David made us mention that says that if we have somebody that we're going to execute, they're condemned to death, essentially their body belongs to us. If the criminal volunteers, they're atoning for their, their, their uh, crime, the family doesn't collect the body or the family donates the body and the organs. So it's already in the books that there's a, a, a quasi-legal framework to take somebody that's executed, but that's different from somebody that is condemned to death and somebody that is not condemned to death, but has been typed and essentially becomes the de facto organ bank for, for China. So execution by organ procurement, breaching the, bread, the, the dead uh, donor rule in China. Do we have anybody that's actively practicing medicine in the crowd? I'll go through this a little bit, but I won't go uh, uh, through it too much in detail. But I think the two mo most important issues are, number one, we require if somebody is going to donate their organs and somebody's going to be an organ donor, even if it's on their driver's license, we require that they have been, uh, they have been deemed to be brain dead. And that does include the brain stem being dead and no drive to breathe on your own. So I think that's, a, when we say apnea, that means somebody just is not breathing on their own. What that requires is mechanical ventilation. Put a tube down into the, the, the windpipe and the, the machine essentially breathes for the patient. So this is what, when I was a resident and I was taking care of patients that were in the intensive care unit and they were dying and they were gonna be donors, this was something that we did was 
was pronounce them as brain dead. There's also an injunction against physicians participating in execution. So th this paper, I think, addresses those important uh, uh, issues. So apnea, essentially, you have to show that, again, the brainstem is dead. The organs may still be working, but the patient is often ventilated in, and on a breathing machine uh, and essentially has the machine breathing for the patient. And to prove that, you can see you, there's, there's a specific test and a specific way that physicians will do that to see if the patient still has any drive to breathe on their own. And if they don't, they, they, they are, that's part of the list of factors that say that that patient is brain dead. And so with this paper, what you saw, uh, what, what, what um, Matthew Robertson and Jay Levy did was they looked at papers published in China from 1980 to 2015. And they combed through 125,000 papers and what they did using uh, R code and using the sophisticated machine, what they did was they looked for papers that specifically talked about heart and lung transplants where the patient would die, right? This isn't donating a kidney. So they looked at heart and lung transplants. And then they, they, what they tried to do is find papers that specifically talked about what happened to the donor. And when they went through all that, here's the Prisma um, uh, slide here and, and the flow chart that they went through. But on the bottom, just notice that there were 71 papers. They actually went through by hand 310, but by machine went through all of these papers that were published in the Chinese language that were about transplant, but then wanted to find ones that specifically talked about the donor and talked about heart and lung transplants. And the, of the 71 studies, they, they, they crossed 56 different hospitals. Um, there were 33 cities that were rep represented. Over 300 medical workers were on these publications. So this is a huge number of individuals that are, being, that, that are involved in forced organ harvesting, essentially. What they found when they pulled out some of the reports was what happened to the donor. And I'll just read this because this is pretty hard to see. Um, but here's one that said the donor was intravenously injected with heparin an hour before the operation. The heartbeat was weak and the myocardium was purple. There's no way you know that unless you've already cut the chest open and are looking at the heart. And then after assisted ventilation through tracheal intubation, so now the patient has been put on a breathing tube, the myocardium turned red and the heartbeat turned strong. So this is the kind of evidence they were looking at. The donor clearly was not brain dead when the, the, when the heart was being extracted. This, the, on the left, this is from the paper. On the right, th this is from the, the research that, that David Manis and David Kilgore were doing. I just show this because this is a map of China. This shows that this isn't like black market organ transplant, where you have maybe a group of individuals doing this. This is scattered throughout China. This is systematic. This is being run. This is state sanctioned uh, killing of, of people for their organs. I want to talk briefly also about this, this paper that was published in April 2020. And it's, it's, it's almost hard to believe. If you go back four years, we're in the middle of COVID. Nobody knows what this virus is doing. It's kind of this jarring thing that we know has come out of China, but there was very little known about it at the time. So there was a publication in the Annals of Surgery, which is a very well-respected uh, journal, and it was titled Lung Transplant in Elderly Patients with End-Stage COVID-19. And if you go back and try to remember what was happening at that time, we had no idea. Patients were, were innovative. They, they were very, they were dying of, of progressive uh, hypoxic respiratory failure. But there were, th this, this was a publication on two patients, a 66-year-old woman. ECMO is, is essentially like dialysis. It's a machine that is trying to put oxygen into your blood and mechanical ventilation. You can see on February 26th of 2020, the patient was registered on their transplant list. And then March 1st, they had, they, they, they had a, a lung transplant. So that was a leap year, that's four days later. And then a 70 year old man, similar situation, three days later gets a lung transplant. So I think some, a lot of times this, these publications that are coming, this is a publication out of China, they're coming out of China 
really kind of boasting we're, we're the world's first to transplant COVID, right? But if you look at the median wait time in the United States, we're talking again about months. Now, if somebody is, is very, very sick, you can get transplants quicker. Like I think some of the, the, the data from Duke is that in weeks you can get lung transplants. But the interesting thing about this paper, there was, there was no mention of free and voluntary consent of the donors. And there was no internationally established ethical standards. And then the other interesting thing that, that, that we reported back to the Annals of Surgery uh, was that there was no outcome data. We just knew the patients had gotten lung transplants and then we didn't really know what happened. So I, I think this is, the, this is the real challenge is taking that paper and then saying, well, clearly there's people that are waiting to die and people that are waiting to, to, to essentially be effective donors uh, to people that need those organs, right? But then how do we essentially how do we combine all that data and start to make a picture, but then how do we get doctors and medical societies and physicians to wake up to the reality and do something? And so in 2022, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation did publish a, a position statement. And I'll just read from that, given the body of evidence that the government of the People's Republic of China stands alone in continuing to systematically support the procurement of organs or tissue from executed prisoners, which we're not talking about people that have been condemned to death. We're talking about people that are essentially killed for their organs. Um, submissions related to transplantation and involving other, either organs or tissue from hu human donors from the PRC or the People's Republic of China will not be accepted to their, their publication. So this, this is one, I think, facet of trying to say, is it legitimate if those two people that got lung transplants got them because two innocent people were, were killed for their organs? Should we be legitimizing the, the, uh, those kinds of publications? And in, in, you know, in, in the opinion of this society, no. In my opinion, no. Um, the Association of American Physicians and, and Surgeons had a position statement on forced organ harvesting that was just published in July of last year, essentially saying there was overwhelming evidence that forced organ harvesting is happening. Um, there's been medical testing of Falun Gong, Uyghurs, Christians, and others. Uh, you can find this online, but it condemns forced organ harvesting, and it talks about educating and training personnel uh, from China in transplant, which I, I think is a real uh, complicit crime. So just in conclusion, there is a complete lack of transparency and ethical standards uh, in Chinese transplant and in Chinese hospitals. Um, we talked about the American Journal of Transplantation, the, the paper that was published in 2022, Execution by Organ Procurement, where essentially the medical system is becoming the executioner. Um, the Chinese publication showing the real difficulty of uh, essentially looking at our collaboration with the Chinese transplant system, and then we're, we are seeing an increased awareness by medical societies. Thank you so much. Thank you, well done. You are on time. <laughs> A brown cookie for you. Brownie. Um, Next one will be a Cindy Song. Uh, she's a movie producer and a writer for the award-winning documentary, State Organs, which just released 2024. And the, um, I call out, okay. Um, the, uh, this documentary look into the, uh, the stories of Yun Zhang and Shang Huang, both disappeared shortly after the uh, Beijing's campaign of persecution against Falun Gong on July 20, 1999. This is a 75 minute documentary uh, film that has won best direction in feature length documentary and the best music scores and was nominated for the best screening and the best picture editing, best sound, best feature lens documentary at the uh, 2023 Leo Awards. And the, um, the, the filmmaker actually, uh, he won the Peabody Award 
and uh, and the music uh, composer won the Emmy and the Grammy Award in the past. So uh, you have ten minutes. Choose is power. Choose, choose has power. Choose could be your power. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor to be here. Thanks all for inviting me. I'd like to start with a. Uh, I'd like to start with a personal story. Then I will talk about why I made this film. In May 1999, I was a prosecutor in China. If you were with me in my office one day you would witness this. Suddenly there was an urgent call. Attention please, attention please. Everyone go to the meeting room. We rushed to a big conference room on the top floor and I closed a big brown wooden door. The boss was sitting there. We received important instruction from the higher level. You must class cases that Falun Gong practitioners committed suicide or murder and the report for publicity. But we don't have those cases. Our office was communicating with the, with the media regularly. Had we had those cases, it would be out there in no time, but we didn't have. It's a political task. No, you may, some of you may wonder what is Falun Gong. Let me digress a little bit and talk about it. So Falun Gong is a cultivation system for both mind and body. It has five sets of exercises, including meditation and the moral teachings centered on the value, truthfulness, compassion, forbearance. All Falun Gong activities were free to the public and no charges at all. People would gather in a park in the morning Somebody will volunteer to play the music. If you drop by and see, hey, what's going on here? Would you like to try? Come here, I'll show you how to do it. Do I have to pay for it? No. So it's a volunteer-based community activity. By 1999, about 100 million people were practicing Falun Gong. The number became the issue. So let's turn back to that meeting. At the meeting, we were told the Chinese Communist Party decided to eradicate Falun Gong from Chinese society for two reasons. First, Falun Gong has too many followers. It surpassed the number of Chinese Communist Party membership. Second, the Falun Gong moral teachings is contradict with Chinese Communist Party's ideology, which is essentially Atheism, materialism. So two months, two months later, on the afternoon of July 22nd, 1999, if you were in the TV repair store in China, you would hear this. Your phone was ringing all the time. You pick up the phone, you would hear, hey, my remote control is broken. It didn't change the channel. It was actually an order from the Chinese Communist Party all channels were airing the same program. Those fake stories demonize Falun Gong. What is the truth then? They don't care. So I experienced this in China, but when I read a report from Mr. Matus in 2006, I was still shaken to the core. I always want to know more about the victim and their families. What happened to them? What would their experience look like? But many Chinese families, they were too scared to speak out. But when I met Professor John and his family, I realized there was something more to it. In China, when the police took Falun Gong practitioners away, they don't have to charge them. They don't have to tell their families. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, you took my son away. Where is he now? I have nothing to tell you. As parents, no one wants to think their child was being killed for their organs. In their hearts, they always hope, my child is still alive. 
He must be somewhere. He might be hiding. One day he will come home. They cling to the thread of hope, which sustained their life in the long and painful wait. What's the truth? They don't want to face it because it's too painful. In the past two decades, millions of Chinese families lost their loved one to the state crime. Their stories must be told. Forced organ harvesting is a haunting scar on humanity's conscience. It's comparable to the Holocaust to World War II, but the difference is it's still going on. If each and every one of us take a small action, share what you hear, what you see today with your family, with your friends, together we could change the course of history because truth it has power. Truth is power. Truth could be your power. Thank you all. Thank you. So just to remind everyone, we will have a movie soon in our state of the children in Science Center, lecture from 8, from 6 to 8 p.m. So uh, producer Cindy Song will be there, and uh, there will be a QA and a session after the movie soon. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, let me repeat what I just said uh, with the microphone here. Uh, so tonight at uh, 6 o'clock, from 6 to 8, we're going to have uh, a documentary uh, movie screening uh, uh, at the Science Center, uh, Lecture Hall E. What is on 1 Oxford Street, okay? So you're welcome to, to, to come to see the, uh, the documentary. Uh, the next speaker will be Han Yu. She, um, she's the doctor of the uh, daughter of the uh, Falun Gong practitioner who is a victim of this uh, false organ harvesting from New York. Um, there you have Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, give me the <clears throat> opportunity to share my father's story. <clears throat> Sorry. My name is Yu Han, and uh, I firmly believe that my father, Jun Qing Han, was a victim of forced organ harvesting in China. My father was a practitioner of Falun Gong and the Chai tried to be a better person under the guidance of Falun Gong's principles of truthful nation, compassion, and tolerance. After the persecution of Falun Gong started in 1999, my father was arrested a few times and then tortured when he was detained in the labor camps. His final arrest occurred on February 28, 2004. Where he uh, in Beijing, where he was tragically persecuted to die after two months. The police didn't allow our family to see my father until more than one month after my father's death. On that day, the Function Police Branch dispatched a lot of police cars and the personnel to closely monitor the site. We were not allowed to bring cameras and uh, nor for uh, nor a lot to invite reporters. Uh, only the immediate family member were allowed to see the body, two, pe two people in each turn, under the close watch of police mom said. When I saw my father's body, I observed he was terribly thin and bruised all over. His face was gone and scarred in several places. But what, but what shocked me the most were the thick black stitches on his throat area. The incision extended down into his clothes. When I tried to unbutton his clothes to examine the wounds, the police immediately stopped me and forced me out of the facility. Next, my uncle and my aunt went in they tore open my father's clothes when the policemen 
when the policemen were looking and found that the incision stretched from his throat all the way down to his abdomen. When they pressed his abdomen, they found that it was stuffed with hard eyes. My uncle was furious and confronted the police about what they had done to my father. The police just replied that this was due to an autopsy, but my family never authorized an autopsy. The police also refused to release the autopsy report. After our final viewing, my father's body was cremated and buried under the supervision of the police. While transforming his body, my stepmother found that my father's left arm was broken. After seeing his body, I had so many questions about his death, but I, I didn't get any answer until three years later. I finally learned the truth. Tens of thousands of prisoners of conscience had been killed by the Chinese Communist Party for their organs. My whole body was trembling after reading the report. I couldn't believe that such evil could exist. Then I thought about my father's death, the incision and the stitches on his body, which clearly indicated that his organ had been harvested, likely while he was still alive. I could not imagine what he had suffered before he died. I cried all night long until I passed out. In most countries, a transplant patient has to wait for years before a matching organ become available. But in China, the wait time is very short because the organ usually don't come from the voluntary donor. They are taken from they are taken forcibly from prisoners detained for their belief, just like my father. It hurts every time I retell this story, but I don't want my father's death to happen in vain. We can't stop forced organ harvesting in China, and we must. Thank you. Okay, we, let's start the uh, Q&A session. So we invite all the panelists to be on the uh, stage here. Uh, just a reminder that uh, uh, if you have any question, you should first identify yourself with your name, occupation, and you know, in case you are from uh, here on campus, you tell us which school you belong. Thank you very much, and uh, so. Uh,